Welcome to EPG Pathshala. I'm Sandesha Raipa from JNU's Linguistic Empowerment Cell. And today we will be discussing on the paper on literary criticism, the module titled Literature and the Condition of Postmodernity, Leotard and Frederick Jameson. Now the term postmodernism is usually applied to the period in literature and literary theory since the 1960s, though some regard postmodernism as the prevailing intellectual mood since World War II ended in 1945. Now numerous philosophers, critics and belteristic writers can be seen as precursors or early representatives of the cultural and aesthetic approach that would come to be called postmodernism. Among them being Martin Heidegger, Walter Benjamin, Bertolt Brecht, Jorge Luis Borges and Roland Barthes. These are the prominent ones. Unlike other avant-garde or progressive movements before it, postmodernism rejects the metaphysical underpinnings of Western thought and culture at the very deepest level. Postmodernism is characterized by a strikingly radical skepticism towards all aspects of Western culture, the impetus for which may many practitioners of postmodern theory themselves trace back to the writings of the 19th century philosopher Frederick Nietzsche. Now Nietzsche's spiritual descendants seek, in so many words, a new kind of meaning independent of the prevailing cultural myth of objective truth. Coming to the next subtopic, where we define the postmodernism. Now Arnold Toynbee in 1947 first used the term postmodernism to describe a contemporary Western world in crisis when people struggle to make sense of a century characterized by conflict and mass genocide, leading to the questioning of traditional moral values and beliefs. But by 1970s, the term had undergone a wide change in meaning to refer to the extension and development of cultural modernism, the artistic and literary style that had enjoyed a period of massive influence between the wars and experienced a revival of interest in the 1960s. Later still, postmodernism has taken on the wider definition with which it is now associated. As Steve Padley in Key Concepts in Contemporary Literature defines, a critical apparatus through which contemporary society and culture could be examined, though not interpreted or explained along conventional theoretical, historical or philosophical lines. Now, for a better understanding of postmodernism as a movement, it can be viewed against the background of modernism when writers like T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, W.B. Yeats, Isra Pound, Gertrude Stein, and many more writers made a collective effort to revive Western literature without advancing the realist tradition or the bourgeois morality of the 19th century. After the devastation of the First World War, and accompanying techn technological pro progress, modernists still hoped to establish a more critical literature and culture that still exhibits the desire for order, albeit new forms of order, in its aesthetics, while postmodernism, coming in the wake of another world war, abandons the search for totality altogether and sets out to particularize, question, and subvert. Postmodernism offers no suggestion of anything like a comprehensive substitute worldview. Mary Clegis, in her book, Literary Theory, A Guide for the Perplexed, makes this difference between modernism and postmodernism clearer by providing the literary characteristics of modernism and later that of postmodernism. Now to know the differences from a literary perspective, the main characteristics of modernism include an emphasis on impressionism and subjectivity in writing and in visual arts as well, an emphasis on how seeing or reading or perception itself takes place rather than on what is perceived, 
An example of this would be stream of consciousness writing. Another one is a movement away from the apparent objectivity provided by omniscient third person narrators, fixed narrative points of view and clear cut moral positions. Faulkner's multiply narrated stories are an example of this aspect of modernism. Another one, a blurring of distinctions between genres so that poetry seems more documentary as seen in T.S. Eliot or E.E. E. Cummings and prose seems more poetic as in Wolf or Joyce. The next one, an emphasis on fragmented forms, discontinuous narratives and random seeming collages of different materials. Next one, a tendency towards reflexivity or self-consciousness about the production of the work of art so that each piece calls attention to its own status as a production, as something constructed and consumed in particular ways. Another one, a rejection of elaborate formal aesthetics in favor of minimalist designs as seen in the poetry of William Carlos Williams and a rejection in large part of formal aesthetic theories in favor of spontaneity and discovery in creation. To give you another one, a rejection of the distinction between high and low or popular culture, both in choice of materials used to produce art and in methods of displaying, distributing and consuming art. Now, postmodernism, like modernism, follows most of these same ideas, rejecting boundaries between high and low forms of art, rejecting rigid genre distinctions, emphasizing pastiche, parody, bricolage, irony and playfulness. Postmodern art and thought favors reflexivity and self-consciousness, fragmentation and discontinuity, especially in narrative structures, ambiguity, simultaneity and an emphasis on the destructured, decentered, dehumanized subject. But while postmodernism seems very much like modernism in these ways, it differs from modernism in its attitude towards a lot of these trends. Modernism, for example, tends to present a fragmented view of human subjectivity and history. Uh, for example, think of the wasteland or, for instance, wolves to the lighthouse. But it presents that fragmentation as something tragic, something to be lamented and mourned as a loss. Many modernist works try to uphold the idea that works of art can provide the unity, coherence and meaning which has been lost in most of modern life. Art will do what other human institutions fail to do. Postmodernism, in contrast, doesn't lament the idea of fragmentation, provisionality or incoherence, but rather celebrates that. The world is meaningless. Let's not pretend that art can make meaning, then let's just play with nonsense. Now, postmodernism means to make a clean break with the past in the sense that the past and its way of looking at the world become the subject of satirical, often sarcastic play with historical figures, text and ideologies. Postmodernism represents a final disillusionment with Western cultural preconceptions and indulges in a merciless rethinking of history, pedagogy and aesthetics in literature, the visual arts and architecture. Now, this disillusionment peaked in the culturally and politically rebellious years of the 1960s, during which the prestige of United States, a putative champion of traditional Western values, was called into question by a protracted, brutal and ultimately unsuccessful interventionist war in Southeast Asia. So now, by the same token, postmodernism in the days after the end of the Cold War, which lasted between 1945 and 1989, is no closer to offering the direction, but asserts only its prerogative to question infinitely and to subvert. Let's go to the next topic, which is features of postmodernism and postmodern literature. Since some critics resist the label postmodernist and still others deny there actually exists a movement or school of postmodernism, it is best to identify the common features usually in play when scholars use this term. First, the postmodernists can be said to see language as the multi-layered medium within which we must search for meaning, all the while aware of the impossibility of absolute knowledge. Now, meaning, as deconstructionists like Derrida insist, is a matter of contrast 
within linguistic context, it is created by difference, not by the identity of the sign, that is the word, with, with, with that which the sign represents. Related to this is the principle of undecidability, by which the postmodernists believe in the impossibility of deciding between two or more competing interpretations. For them, our ability to make a decision about the validity of a statement is suspended or remains undecided as all absolute values like God, truth, reason, the law, and so on become site of questioning, of rethinking of new kinds of affirmation. They give a new attention to the value of undecidable. Bennett and Royal, in their book, Introduction to Literature, Criticism and Theory, say, for postmodern critics, undecidability radically undermines the very principle of unity. These critics celebrate multiplicity, heterogeneity, difference. Undecidability splits the text, disorders it. Undecidability dislodges the principle of a single final meaning in a literary text. Now, the postmodernist thinkers throw a radical challenge to intellectual attitudes dated back to the 18th century. Enlightenment, such as the belief that reason and rationalism held the key to progress in all spheres of human endeavor, including science, philosophy, politics, and culture. The postmodernists are skeptical about the claims of progress in history, especially after the evidence of the two world wars and recurrent acts of genocide and inhumanity. But it doesn't mean that they celebrate irrationality. Rather, their attitude can be understood as a suspension and deconstruction of the opposition between the rational and the irrational. Now, Bennett and Royal, in their book, Introduction to Literature, Criticism and Theory, say, Irrationalism in itself is only another form of rationalism because it is dependent for its definition on its opposite. The postmodern could be seen as concerned rather with what Jacques Derrida calls a new enlightenment, concerned to explore the value and importance of ways of thinking that cannot be reduced to an opposition between the rational and the irrational. Now, Bennett and Royal, Royal also highlight the fragmentation as a characteristic form of postmodernism. They say that the postmodern provides a, kind, a new kind of critique of the very ideas of fragment and totality, which have taken the form of, among other things, a fundamental questioning of the notion of originality and correspondingly a new kind of emphasis on citation and intertextuality, parody and prestige. Fragmentation in the postmodern does not depend on the possibility of an original unity, which has been lost. Another way of thinking about postmodern fragmentation is in terms of dissemination. Dissemination involves a sense of scattering, as in a scattering of seeds or sins, of origins and ends, of identity, center, and presence. Postmodern fragmentation is without origin. It is dissemination without any assurance of a center or a destination. Now, the postmodern challenges the logocentric, that is the authority of the word, the possibility of the final meaning of or of being in the presence of pure sense. It challenges the ethnocentric, that is the authority of one ethnic identity or culture, such as Europe or the West or Islam or Hinduism. It challenges the phallocentric, that is everything that privileges the symbolic power and significance of phallus. As Ihab Hassan remarks, the postmodern may be summarized by a list of words prefixed by D and I. For example, you have deconstruction, decentering, dissemination, dispersal, displacement, difference, discontinuity, demystification, delegitimization, or disappearance. Ihab Hassan said this, now in place of the center, but not in its place, there is alterity, otherness, a multiplicity and dispersal of centers, origins and presences. Now the boundary between fact and fiction is often dissolved in postmodernism. Neither historiography nor science writing is exempt from skepticism about its fundamental tenets. And like narrative fiction, both are regarded as human constructs and inventive creations. 
Borrowing from the terminology of Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science, postmodernists regard the modern, rationalistic, technologically oriented worldview as a paradigm that will one day be replaced by the paradigms of a new worldview, just as the heliocentric universe replaced the Ptolemaic system. Relativity underscored the limits of Newtonian physics and forced the 20th century to readjust fundamentally the received paradigm for the behavior of the physical world. Science, it is argued, cannot be regarded as decisive or complete. Another common assumption in postmodernism is that there is nothing necessarily essential about human beings. The idea of human nature is itself a human construct among many. Thus, the concentration on depicting universal experience in traditional literature is irrelevant and illusionary. Now, the postmodern art is not self-sufficient but exists in relation to other texts and consciously refers to other works of art like intertextuality. It borrows and manipulates freely without any of the traditional deference for the works of high culture or their creators. Now clearly, any literature that assails injustice as postmodernist literature so often does is not nihilistic or devoid of values, however much it wishes to be free of conventions and traditional attachments. However, the postmodern approach is one which more often than not exposes rather than explicitly condemns. By the same token, postmodern accepts and embraces mass culture and goes out of its way to turn up its nose. Andy Warhol's pop art images are the visual counterpart to the literary use of cultural icons and items of mass production, where once literature celebrated and participated in high culture apart from and superior to other crafts and trades. As for specific techniques, the novels of postmodernism are often self-conscious meta-narratives. They do not tell a story without commenting on the narrative enterprise and paradoxically questioning their own claims to narrative and epistemological validity. For example, the British author John Falls is a master of this sort of postmodernist inversion and ambiguity, though his inversions are final ones occurring at the end of the narrative with alternative conclusions, as in The French Little Woman, 1969. Now, in the works of many other writers, narrative ambiguity permeates the text, however bewildering many readers. Con conventional perspective is also absent. Postmodernist literature shirks the omniscient third-person narrative voice and often floats perspective among several narrators. This kind of literature also often excerpts or samples from other documents of various kinds and playfully manipulates history and historical figures, as in the works of Umberto Eco, Milan Kundera, Ian Watson, and others. Ironically, the postmodernist self assertiveness towards high culture, not as much as sweeping disdain as a reaction uh, against exaggerated cultural deference results often in a new type of arcane, even elitist literature. Rarely in the history of literature has any movement been as academic and self-referential as postmodernism. Postmodern authors often use a technique of collage for the narrative and compositional construction of their works. Now, the collage breaks the linearity of narration, enables a stylistic and generic hybridity, and offers a multiple, pluralistic and often relativistic vision of the world. In difference from traditional modernist collage, in which it, its parts or the elements of the collage, that is different styles, characters, narrative voices, etc., can be understood only in their relation to other parts, like chapters, styles, characters from other parts of the book. The elements or parts creating a postmodern collage in a literary work are mostly self-sufficient um, and can themselves create meaning of their own. Although, of course, the full understanding of such a work requires reading all the parts, elements or segments of the text. Now, coming to the next subtopic, Jean Letard, born in 1924, died in 1998, and the postmodern condition, a report on knowledge, 
Um, Lyotard is best known for his highly influential formulation of postmodernism in the postmodern condition, commissioned by the government of Quebec and published in 1979. Lyotard famously defines the postmodern as incredulity towards meta narratives, where meta narratives are understood as totalizing stories about history and the goals of the human race that ground and legitimize knowledges and cultural practices. Now, the two meta-narratives that Lyotard sees as having been most important in the past are 1. History as progressing towards social enlightenment and emancipation 2. Knowledge as progressing towards total totalization Modernity is defined as the age of meta-narrative legitimation and post-modernity as the age in which meta-narratives have become bankrupt. Through his theory of the end of meta-narratives, Lyotard develops his own version of what tends to be a consensus among theorists of the postmodern, postmodernist as an age of fragmentation and pluralism. He says that postmodernity marks the end of meta-narratives or grand narratives like Christianity or Marxism or the Enlightenment, which attempt to provide a framework for everything. Such narratives follow a theological movement towards a time of equality, and justice, like after the last judgment, the revolution, or the scientific com conquest of nature, injustice, unreason, and even will end. Lyotard argues that the contemporary worldview, by contrast, is characterized by micro-narratives. Contemporary Western discourse is characteristically unstable, fragmented, dispersed, not a worldview at all. Little narratives or micro-narratives present local explanations of individual events or phenomena but do not claim to explain everything. A little narratives are fragmentary, non-totalizing and non-theological. Lyotard claims that in the West, grand narratives have all but lost their efficacy, that their legitimacy and powers of legitima legitimation have been dispersed. Legitimation is now plural, local and contingent. Now, the postmodern condition is a study of the status of knowledge in computerized societies. It is Lyotard's view that certain technical and technological advancements have taken place in the Second World War and this historical pinpointing of the beginning of postmodernity, which have had and are still having a radical effect on the status of knowledge in the world's most advanced countries. As a defining element, with which to characterize these technical and techno technological advancements, Lyotard chooses computerization. Lyotard identifies the problem with which he is dealing, the variable in the status of knowledge, as one of legitimation. For Lyotard, this is a question of both knowledge and power. Knowledge and power are simply two sides of the same question. Who decides what knowledge is? And who knows what needs to be decided? According to Lyotard, in the computer age, the question of knowledge is now more than ever a question of government. With vast amounts of knowledge stored digitally in databases, who decides what knowledge is worth storing? What is legitimate knowledge? And who has access to these databases? Lyotard points a suspicious finger at multinational corporations Using IBM as an example, he suggests a hypothetical in which the corporation owns a certain belt in the Earth's orbital field, in which circulate satellites for communication and or for storing data banks. Lyotard then asks that who will have access to these and who will determine which channels or data are forbidden. The method Lyotard chooses to use in his investigations is that of language games. He writes that the developments in postmodernity is dealing with have been largely concerned with language. Lyotard's use of language games is derived from Ludwig Wittgenstein. The theory of language games means that each of the various categories of utterance can be defined in terms of rules, specifying their properties and the uses to which they can be put. For both Wittgenstein and Lyotard, language games are incommensurable and moves in one language game cannot be translated into moves in another language game. 
Lyotard's choice of language games is primarily political in motivation and relates to the close links between knowledge and power. In examining the status of knowledge in postmodernity, Lyotard is examining the political as well as epistemological aspects of knowledge, that is legitimation, and he sees the basic social bond, that is the minimum relation required for society to exist as moves within language games. Lyotard argues that even as the status of knowledge has changed in postmodernity, so has the nature of the social bond, particularly as it is evident in society's institutions of knowledge. In his analysis of the state of knowledge in postmodernity, Lyotard firstly distinguishes between two types of knowledge, that is narrative knowledge and scientific knowledge. Narrative knowledge is the kind of knowledge prevalent in primitive or traditional societies and is based on storytelling, sometimes in the form of ritual, music and dance. Narrative knowledge has no recourse to legitimation. Its legitimation is immediate within the narrative itself, in the timelessness of the narrative as an enduring tradition. It is told by people who once heard it to listeners who will one day tell it themselves. There is no question of questioning. It, indeed, Leotard suggests that there is an incommensurability between the question of legit legitimation itself and the authority of narrative knowledge. Now, in scientific knowledge, however, the question of legitimation always arises. Scientific knowledge is legitimated by certain scientific criteria, that is, the, re the repeatability of experiments, etc. Now, if the entire project of science needs a meta-legitimation, however, and the criteria for scientific knowledge would itself seem to demand that it does, then science has no recourse but to narrative knowledge, which according to scientific criteria is no knowledge at all. So this narrative has usually taken the form of a heroic epic of some kind with the scientist as a hero of knowledge who discovers scientific truths. The distinction between narrative and scientific knowledge is a crucial point in Lyotard's theory of postmodernism and one of the defining features of postmodernity on his account is the dominance of scientific knowledge over narrative knowledge. Lyotard sees a danger in this dominance since it follows from his view that reality cannot be captured within one genre of discourse or representation of events that science will miss aspects of events which narrative knowledge will capture. Now, in other words, Lyotard does not believe that science has any justification in claiming to be a more legitimate form of knowledge than narrative. Part of his work in the postmodern condition can be re read as a defense of narrative knowledge from the increasing dominance of scientific knowledge. Furthermore, Lyotard sees a danger to the future of academic research which stems from the way scientific knowledge has come to be legitimated in postmodernity as opposed to the way it was legitimated in modernity. In modernity, the narrative of science was legitimated by one of a number of meta-narratives. According to Lyotard, post-modernity is characterized by the end of meta-narratives. So, what legitimates science now? Lyotard's answer is performativity. This is what Lyotard calls the technological criteria, the most efficient input-output ratio. It was during the Industrial Revolution, Lyotard suggests that knowledge entered into, into the economic equation and became a force for production. But it is in postmodernity that knowledge is becoming the central force for production. He believes that knowledge is becoming so important an economic factor, in fact, that he suggests that one day wars will be waged over the control of information. Diotard calls the change that has taken place in the status of knowledge due to the rise of the performativity criteria, the mercantilization of knowledge. In postmodernity, knowledge has become primarily a saleable commodity. Today, students no longer ask if something is true, but what use is it to them? Lyotard believes that computerization and the legitimization of knowledge by the performativity criteria of doing away with the idea that the absorption of knowledge is inseparable from the training of minds. Lyotard does not believe that the innovations he predicts in postmodern education will necessarily have a detrimental effect on erudition. He does, however, see a problem with the legitimation of knowledge by performativity. 
This problem lies in the area of research. Leotard argues that legitimation by performativity is against the interests of research. He does not claim that research should be aimed at production of the truth. He does not try to re-invoke the meta-narratives of modernity to legitimate research. Rather, he sees the role of research as the production of ideas. Legitimation of knowledge by performativity terrorizes the production of ideas. What then is the alternative? Lyotard proposes that a better form of legitimation would be legitimation by paralogy. The etymology of this word resides in the Greek words para, which means beside, past, beyond, and logos, which is, it, it has a sense as reason. Thus, paralogy is the movement beyond or against reason. Leotard sees reason not as a universal and immutable human faculty or principle, but as a specific and variable human production. Paralogy for him means the movement against an established way of reasoning. In relation to research, this means the production of new ideas by going against or outside of established norms of making new m moves in language games, changing the rules of uh, language games, and inventing new games. Leotard argues that this in fact is what takes place in scientific research, despite the imposition of the performativity criteria of legitimation. This is particularly evident in what Leotard calls postmodern science, the search for instabilities. For Leotard, knowledge is not only the known, but also the revelation or articulation of the unknown. Thus, he advocates the legitimation of knowledge by paralogy as a form of legitimation that would satisfy both the desire for justice and the desire for the unknown. Coming to Frederick Jameson and postmodernism, in postmodernism or the cultural logic of late capitalism, Frederick Jameson inaugurated a materialistic critique of the postmodern in literature, architecture, and the arts. The collection of essays by the same name, which was published in 1991, established Jameson as a leading theorist of postmodernism. Though most of the postmodernist theorists attack the form of totality or grand narratives of modernity, but it is Frederick Jameson who still finds value in talking about totality. He is a literary and art critic who accepts the basic Marxist analysis of society. He therefore works within a master narrative, though he does not accept it naively or uncritically. Rather, he tries to change the Marxist theory to bring it up to date and make it fit the postmodern world. Totality is still a valuable idea, Jameson claims, because we should try to understand how all the pieces of our world and our experience fit together. We will never fully succeed, but in making the effort, we will change ourselves and our world for the better. Why? Because knowledge gives us power. The more we make sense out of our world, the more we can make wise choices and act upon them to improve our world. If we don't try to make the pieces fit together in our minds, we let things go on the way they are. And the way they are is not very satisfying. A few people around the world are very rich and powerful. Some people, mostly in the highly industrialized countries, are pretty comfortable and perhaps have an illusion of power when they vote or buy stock in a company. Most people in the world are poor or on the margin of poverty, suffering in various physical and emotional ways and quite powerless to do anything about it. Now, as a Marxist, Jameson assumes that people want and should have the greatest possible control over their own lives. He realizes that many postmodernists disagree. They fear that when we strive for control, we inevitably try to dominate others, to eliminate difference and diversity by imposing our own views on others. But he is willing to take that risk. He believes that it is possible to seize control over our own des destinies without violating the freedom of others. To this, we must understand not just various parts of our world, but the totality of it. We must see the bigger picture as full as possible. We will never understand it entirely. And there is always a danger 
that by describing the big picture as master narratives do, we will falsify some part of it. A master narrative is an abstraction. It always has a certain fictional quality when it claims to tell the whole truth in a single story. But Jameson suggests a Marxist analysis can bring us closer to the whole truth than any other story. In that sense, it is an especially useful fiction because it can give us more freedom to control our own lives than any other story. A Marxist analysis of the totality of our world starts with a basic premise our lives are shaped above all by the mode of production that exists in our society. So now Mary Clages sums up Jameson's views beautifully when she says that according to Frederick Jameson, modernism and postmodernism are cultural formations which accompany particular stages of capitalism. Jameson outlines the three primary phases of capitalism which dictate particular cultural practices including what kind of art and literature is produced. Now the first is market capitalism which occurred in the 18th to the late 19th century in Western Europe, England and the United States in all their spheres of influence. Now this first phase is associated with particular technological developments namely the steam driven motor and with a particular kind of aesthetics, namely realism. The second phase occurred from the late 19th century until the mid 20th century, about the sec Second World War. This phase, monopoly uh, capitalism, is associated with electric, electric and internal combustion motors and with modernism. The third, the phase we are in now, is multinational or consumer capitalism with the emphasis placed on marketing, selling and consuming commodities, not on producing them, associated with nuclear and electronic technologies and correlated with postmodernism. Modernism was the culture of monopoly capitalism. Postmodernism is the culture of multinational, multinational late capitalism. Now, Jameson titled his major book on the subject, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism in 1991. This does not mean that everything in our culture today is postmodern. There are still many leftover elements of modern culture with us. For example, many of the ideas we study in the university that tell us we should still desire unity. There may also be newly emerging seeds of some future cultural forms beyond postmodernism. But postmodernism is the dominant force in our culture. It is a force that everything and everybody must deal with. Just as capitalism tries to bring all the forces of production under its control, so postmodernism is trying to bring all of culture under its control. In fact, postmodernism is the cultural arm of today's capitalism. It is capitalism's most powerful tool for dominating our lives, and it is quite successful. The features of modern culture are rapidly being replaced by the postmodern. When we study postmodernism, we are looking at the trends that our culture is following. Now, Jameson admits, admits that his theory of postmodernism is basically a kind of prophecy about the future. He looks at present trends to describe what the future will probably be more and more like around the world for a long time to see. Late capitalism and postmodernism have both good and bad qualities, he says. In some ways, they limit human freedom and happiness. In other ways, they increase freedom and happiness. So we should not simply praise or condemn postmodernism. Rather, we should analyze it as carefully as possible because it is our best clue to the true nature of our society. What we need to understand most about postmodernism is the complicated link between the mode of production in late capitalism and the forms of culture today. If we can begin to put the pieces of the puzzle of contemporary reality together, we can begin to think more intelligent, intelligently about our reality. We can decide what we like about it, what we want changed, and how to work together to make those changes. Taking cue from Baudrillard's concept of simulation or the simulacrum, Frederick Jameson goes on to focus on the problem of representation or expression of Western thought of opposition between surface and depth, which involves the idea that the words which we write or speak express something inside our heads, thoughts and feelings. The words are the surface, whereas our thoughts or consciousness represents depth. Similarly, the idea of the self, the very possibility of being human, has conventionally relied on such an opposition. 
the subject or self is constituted as a relation between surface and depth, inside and outside. Frederick Jameson provides a useful account of four depth models that he argues have dominated the West in the 20th century. A. Marxism. It crucially depends on the notion of ideology. This involves the idea that we do not see the reality of the world around us, but only what we have been indoctrin indoctrinated into seeing. B. Psychoanalysis. Freud's theories are based on the distinction between the conscious and the unconscious, whereby the unconscious is held to be the truth behind or beneath the distorted representation, which we call consciousness. C. Existentialism. Existentialism relies on a distinction between, on the one hand, authentic existence and, on the other hand, inauthenticity. Authenticity is the truth of selfhood underlying the distortions affected by a state of inauthenticity. D. Semiotics. Saussurian notions of language presuppose a distinction between the signifier on the one hand and the signified on the other. The word or sound image indicates an underlining idea or mental concept. Now, in each case, the authentic or real is understood to be hidden or disguised, while the surface phenomena, the, fa the facade, is an inauthentic distortion or arbitrary offshoot of underlining truth. With the postmodernism, all of these surface depth models are shaken up. The postmodern suspends, dislocates, and transforms the oppositional structures presupposed by major Western modes of thought by classical Marxist psychoanalysis, existentialism, semiotics. Jameson also distinguishes between parody and pastiche. Postmodern parody was theorized especially by Linda Hutchin, Margaret A. Rose, and partly by Frederick Jameson. The postmodern does not accept traditional view of parody as the main aim of postmodern parody is not to mock the parodied author or style for its own sake. But this parody lacks the mocking, ridiculing aspect and by using irony, it emphasizes a difference between the past forms of art and sensibilities and a distance between the past, past and the present. Postmodern parody becomes self-reflexive -re because it draws our attention not only to the parodied works of art, but implicitly also to the whole process of depiction of reality through the literary works, that is, a process of linguistic representation. By rewriting, transforming, and changing the motives and styles from the parodied literary works, postmodern parody gives an alternative vision of reality, history, and a position of different social, ethnic, and other minority groups which form a playful and creative alternative to the official version of history or reality as depicted in traditional literary works or through traditional narrative techniques and style. Now, this alternative is not aimed to be an official alternative to real history, but a playful and artistic reconsideration and relativization of it. That is also the reason why postmodern authors often parody historics, um, religious books, biographies of authors, myths, works of traditional and popular literature, historical novels, love and detective novels, thrillers, spy and crime fiction, pornography, horrors, etc. In a postmodern literary work, postmodern parody is closely connected with pastiche, which is almost similar to a postmodern literary work, consisting of different styles, genres, narrative voices and devices, each of which has its important uh, role in the composition of the book. But the original meaning of this word as used in arts was rather derogatory. The artists referred to as pastichures were understood as the authors uncreatively and mechanically initiating other works of art, styles, or ways of writing. In postmodern literature and its interpretation, however, this term has a rather positive meaning since the older works of art styles and authors are first imitated but at the same time through the use of parody and irony further transform rewritten and put in a different linguistic context and thus pastiche can be loosely called a blank parody as frederick jameson suggests although jameson's understanding of pastiche is close to linda hutchinson's understanding of postmodern parody and he himself defines pastiche as a kind of parody Postmodernism rejects strict definitions and especially in a postmodern but also other works 
of art is it difficult to delineate strictly parody and pastiche since they often overlap and are rather inseparable. So now at the end of the session, I hope you have a better understanding of literature and the condition of postmodernity, especially um, with reference to uh, Leotard and Frederick Jameson. And um, for further references, uh, please visit the website of EPG Patshala. Thank you.